This is about communities under siege, a call to our nation. After the many years of working in the Department of Emergency Medicine at Kings County Hospital, and participated in countless efforts at resuscitating young men and young women injured by acts of violence. I'm saddened to see that our counts and the plight of those besieged by these acts continues and the toll we pay is exceedingly high. Personally, I'm daunted by the challenges, however, hopeful in the opportunities. We've all heard and or seen the numbers. Homicide is the leading cause of death for African-American males ages 15 through 24, and it is the second leading cause of death for young men of the same age group of Hispanic heritage. One in four will have an encounter with the judicial system before age 25. One in nine are currently housed in jails all across this nation in what has become the largest prison industrial complex of the free world. A nation whose population is 5% of the world's now houses 25% of its prisoners. A prison population in 1973 that totaled 200,000 by 2007 had ballooned to over 2.3 million. And if one consider those on parole and probation, the number extends to over 7.3 million, one in every 35 American. 40, 50, 60, some say as high as 70% of our children are now being raised in single parent homes where the absent parent has little or no relationship with the child. Hence, it is not surprising that domestic violence is on the rise and our families are not insulated from its effects. High school dropout rates in many of our urban schools as high as 40 and 50 percent and numbers that are mirrored when considering students matriculating into four-year college programs not to speak of our postgraduate rates where the matriculant and graduating pools fluctuate between one and three and a half percent. HIV AIDS, 30 years later, continues to be one of the leading causes of death for African American women ages 24 through 38. And as I stand here this moment, 3% of the population of our nation's capital has tested positive for HIV. 11 to 15% of those in prison are also positive for this virus. And our people represent 60% of all the newly diagnosed cases. Now I realize that there's much that can be inferred from these numbers, but the one thing that is evident as I state them here today is that many of our communities are still under siege. Show me a community devoid of hope and opportunities and I will show you a community where violence will not only fester, but it will succeed. We need a truce, but we need a truce today. And I say a truce because inherently we must be willing to work and we must be willing to accept responsibilities for all the factors within our control. But a truce also speaks to our capacity for change. Just as important, we need more voices of dissent. But I speak not of dissent for the purpose of self-aggrandizement. I speak to you of voices with the commitment. Voices with the conviction, voices with the courage and the resolve to stand against all the systemic ills that have led to failing families, that have led to a failing educational, judicial, 
and health care systems that have led to a failing culture, if one may, particularly when the price we pay is our most precious commodity, our youth. You see, when we fail to educate our young, we not only fail to expand their minds and their horizons, but we fail to prepare them for the challenges of the most competitive market in the global economy. When our perception of justice is in fact the delivery of injustice, our people, our communities will continue to lose trust and regards for an institution sworn to be blind in its dispensation of the law. When our healthcare system fails, we fail at the very oath that many of us have taken and that at times appears in mission statements of institutions of health all across this nation. And that is, first, the guarantee of accessibility, but just as important, the delivery of excellence in health care, irrespective of one's color, creed, or ability to pay. And when our family structure fails, we fail at the most basic of social units, that basic social construct that must provide shelter, that must provide guidance, that must offer love and ensure our humanity. You see, this nation survives at the verge of moral and ethical crisis, but in the end, None, None shall, shall be spared, be spared if the entropic, the entropic forces in our midst, midst continues to progress unabated. Let me say that again. I say this nation survives at the edge of moral and ethical crisis. However, none shall be spared if the evil in our midst continues to progress unchallenged. You see, the enemy is not solely black or white, or brown, or yellow. The enemy is also a well-entrenched corporatocracy, imbued in its drunkenness and its arrogance and its greed, that it embellishes its contributions while it denies the most basic of needs to the vulnerable in our midst. We need voices of dissent that understands that the wheels of progress will continuously slow in hands of dispassionate leaders whose reality is vastly different from the people they were chosen to serve. So it is, in fact, our responsibility, and it must become our mandate to challenge the views of that leadership, to challenge, if one may, the possibilities that will one day allow us to redress those inequities that robs our communities of love, that robs our communities of compassion, that robs our people of dignity and respect. You see, I stand before you today fully cognizant that I too could have been part of those statistics, that in many ways my sons have been touched by these statistics. That there's someone out there who listens to me at this moment that has been or will be or knows of someone that has been directly or indirectly impacted by these statistics. But we stand here today, but by the grace of God and the love and the strength of our people. And I say this because I know that somewhere, somehow, Somebody said, yes, you can when no one else believed. You see, someone gave of their means, even when consumed by their needs. Someone loaned a shoulder. Someone opened a door. Someone created an opportunity. And if we are to truly honor those 
who went before us. We must acknowledge here today that somewhere, somehow, somebody even gave his or her life that we may come to you today in this place, on this date, and at this time. So when the question is asked, how can I help? The answer is but one. Because all can, all must. For it matters not what are your talents. It matters not what are your titles. It only matters if those talents and those titles are invested in activities that promote the well-being of your families. Activities that promote the well-being of your neighbors. Activities that promote the well-being of your communities. I speak of acts that strengthens the good health of a nation, the good health of this world. So, let's not be invested in ephemeral actions aimed at styming or trivializing voices of the sense, particularly when the motivation that belies this dissent is in fact the depiction of the social injustice and the prayers, the hopes, and the aspirations for change. You see, for too many young people in our communities, longevity is but a myth. And for some, it is a blessing that others enjoy. But I believe in our history of survival. And so I say to you today that if you are blessed with the gift of longevity, that if you are blessed with that gift of an American dream, that a day will come when all that's left is time and space and a retroscopic compilation of experiences and on that day grateful sons and daughters must continue to look to the heavens and say thank God for the talents and for the ability to share and give back all your talents but it's also important that you look to your people that somehow you will find it within yourselves to look to my people that maybe one day this community that maybe one day this city and state that maybe one day this nation will rise to the dreams and the visions of its founding fathers and finally embrace the legacy of the life of our fallen martyrs and that is that true greatness and honor inexorably lies in the privilege to serve.